What's going on, everyone? Taylor Kyle's here for CLNS Media, coming at you with another episode of Pat Saley, brought to you by our good friends at Price Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of CLNS Media. We're talking quarterbacks. I know, I know, I've been trying to drift away from just the time-honored quarterback conversation. It feels like we're kind of hammering this thing over the head, but that's the nature of the draft. And I figured if we're going to talk about quarterbacks, we might as well get into the, some of the nitty-gritty. A lot's been made about these prospects, their mechanics, why they're good, why they're bad, all that stuff. I'm someone who's still learning about quarterback mechanics and trying to sharpen my eye and know what to look for. So to help me and to also extend that to all of you, I had to call in my favorite quarterback guy, Derek Klassen of Bleach Report and Reception Perception, who's been doing great work, uh, busting his butt recently, especially with crunch time coming. You've been doing great work as always, buddy. But uh, before we get into the nitty gritty, how you doing? Yeah, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Um, it's it's always good to be back on the show. It's always a good time. Uh, I'm doing good, man. I mean, the yeah, like you said, it feels good that we're almost at the end. Still a bit of a grind, but it feels good knowing that the the end is near. Other than that, um, I mean, I've just got the Masters on my other screen, so I'm having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I got to address some of the news surrounding the Patriots quarterback situation. So Adam Schefter, I know Colin Coward and Jordan Schultz, they mentioned it on Coward Show that – Jaden Daniels seems like he's pretty much a lock to go to the Commanders. I really hope that's not just smoke and lying season BS. That would make me very happy if the Commanders potentially get to the Patriots, a franchise player, two seasons in a row. Uh, but it seems like it's going to be Drake May versus J.J. McCarthy at that number three spot. Now, personally, if it's Drake May, fantastic. Run the card up. I feel like that should be a no-brainer. But, you know, I'm coming around to JJ's game. I definitely am. And especially when you look at the off field stuff, like realistically what separates a lot of the good from the great at quarterback and what elevates the guys who aren't super physically talented and getting them into that really competitive range is what they give you off the field and in the intangibles and JJ McCarthy, you know, people talk about it before they talk about his physical traits, which, you know, take that how you want uh, but <laughs> the leadership stuff. And, you know, the fact that he seems to have one of those obsessive kind of competitive personalities are pretty positive if you're looking at a guy who's going to potentially lead the franchise. So at that number three spot, do you really think it could be either or, or do you think, like I do, that it might be a better idea if J.J. McCarthy is the target to potentially trade down then maybe get back into the top five and take him there? I mean, I think it very much could be on the table. I mean, kind of like you said, it seems teams really, really do actually like J.J. McCarthy. Like, I don't think any of the – um you know, character stuff or how he handles himself. I don't think any of that is, is smoke really. Like I, I think teams believe that. And I think, uh, especially after the combine, after talking to him, I think they absolutely believe that. And the Patriots could a hundred percent be one of those teams to your point though. Like if Drake is there, I think, you, I think you have to take Drake over JJ McCarthy every day of the week. Um, but if they are stuck kind of picking between JJ or, you know, if the commanders take Drake, um, you know, JJ and Jaden, I would be less optimistic about, I think, drafting him at three than I think some other people are. I think it's just a huge risk. And I think there's a lot of projection that you have to put into his game. And he could obviously work out. There's stuff, there's stuff that you like, but he, to me, is more a risk that you incur, like trading back up into the 20s as opposed to third overall. Yeah. And I also know Michael Penix Jr. Now, he's someone who doesn't have a ton of ties to the Patriots. I'm not even sure if he's a serious consideration, but... We have to talk about it considering wide receivers coach Tyler Hughes did work with him last season. So maybe they're just trying to, you know, keep their cards close to their chest. And there's been some talk about whether Penix is a second round guy. Maybe should he sneak into the first round conversation? We did talk about this a little while ago. I think in our last show, where we kind of mostly tapped into May and Daniels. But with Penix, especially after the pro day, where obviously he looked pretty good running. I think we both had the understanding he was a better athlete than he was really getting credit for, even though he isn't really a guy who runs very often. So where do you stand now after what we know about the pro day? I also know that you did do your reception perception chart on him, which is pretty illuminating and gave some very good context where, you know, there's a lot of flashes from Penix, but there's also the reality that he does struggle. So how do you feel? Has anything changed for you? Has he crept into that first round conversation? At least for me, not really. I think he could get there because at least of the non four, you know, top four quarterbacks, I think Rattler has no shot of going in the first round just because of, you know, just weird careers, some of the off field stuff, potentially all that jazz. Knicks, I don't think he's going to get there either because I think the physical profile is not as enticing, especially the arm talent. Penix, I at least understand why a team would look at the arm and hear the siren song and want to buy in. Uh, me personally, though, I'm, I, I've not been the biggest fan. I think some of just the way that he 
handles himself in the pocket. I think some of his uh, arm angles are like really, really rigid and kind of limits what he is able to do. I think his accuracy in the one to ten art, the one to ten yard area specifically is not great. Doesn't throw the middle of the field well. So he to me it is just there's a lot of holes in his game that I would be uncomfortable with taking the first round. But again, I think it's entirely possible. And then to your point, yeah, I, I just finished his charting profile. It kind of confirmed a lot of what I thought about him, where, like I just said, not accurate one to ten, kind of struggle throwing off his spot, doesn't throw the middle of the field all that well or that that much really. All of that was kind of confirmed in my charting. And I was just like, ah, I'm I'm probably gonna lock into to what I think about him, I think. Yeah, when it comes to how Penix throws, I feel like people are like, oh, he's a lefty, or he's got that Philip Rivers thing where it just looks bad. I'm like, no, nah, it's still – like, rigid is perfect. So I'm like, no, it looks like there's still something wrong where it just doesn't feel like it really looks natural. And obviously, if you have significant shoulder injuries, like, that's going to be a big part of it. And I feel like that's a bigger factor than the lefty conversation or the uh, funky mechanics, because even if you, there's all those videos where it's like, oh, if he was a righty and you flip it, he looks fine. I'm like, I disagree. I still think it looks yes. kind of weird. Oh. <laughs> I disagree. It still yeah. looks weird. And and the, the one thing I want to say about the Rivers comparisons, it didn't really ever inhibit Rivers' ability to throw with touch. In fact, while he was at his peak, while he was playing, there probably weren't that many better touch throwers, period, in the NFL. Like It was like him, Brady, and like Matt Ryan who were up there in terms of that. Penix has like no touch. So it very clearly inhibits the way that he throws. So that's to me why I just, the Philip River stuff just blows my mind, blows my mind. It, yeah. It, sometimes you make the comparisons because they sound nice, but when you really dig into it, it's just like, ah, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. All right. So now for the small talk, let's get into some of this film. We'll start with Jaden Daniels. Cause obviously we're going to probably go in the order of where people think these guys are going to go. So Jaden is the one who's getting all the hype as a number two prospect after Caleb Williams. So let's dive into some of his film, talk about his mechanics, the things that help him succeed, but also some of the things that he does struggle with. Right, throw you up there. There we go. All right, there we go. Yeah, so even before I start the clip, I want to say mechanically, Jaden is probably actually the cleanest passer in this class. Um, mm -hmm. I think part of that is, you know, you're just, when you're a guy who's played for five years, you're just going to have a, there's more of a rhythm to your game, I think. Um, than a lot of other guys are going to have. You've, you've played with a lot of live bullets before. You, things can slow down for you because you've played so much. And I think you can see that a lot in Jaden's game. Again, he started as a freshman, so there's very clearly some degree of natural throwing ability to him. So in this clip, he's just throwing a, a simple flat route to the back. Like, this is nothing special. But just the, the cadence in which he throws, how clean everything is, I think it's so easy to see here. I'll run it really quick. Um, one, two, three. What I love about this part is as soon as he, you can see his back foot hits, he's already triggering to pull the ball up. You see a lot of the best quarterbacks are able to like seamlessly flow that back foot directly mm -hmm. into like their hip and bring everything up and start to throw. You see that here with Daniels. You can even see as he's starting to throw, he's getting that like lead hand up into his chest. It kind of serves as like a balance point. Um, some quarterbacks love to do that. Some don't, doesn't really matter as it, if it works for you, it works for you. That's great. And I think for Jaden Daniels, it does. And then just a really clean throwing motion. Just look how it's very quick. It's very compact. It's very like forceful at the end, um, which I think is always really important when you're throwing. Some guys can be very like a little bit loose and all over the place through their release point. And I think that hurts them a lot with Jaden Daniels. That's just never really a problem. Um, it'll run from the other angle here, but like you just see how clean and efficient and like almost rehearsed it is for Daniels. Like it just looks so like he's just done this a thousand times in his sleep. And I think that's really yeah. valuable <laughs> when you're trying to operate quick game like this. Right. And when it comes to like mechanics, I feel like him and Spencer Rattler are the guys where you feel the most comfortable that there's not a whole lot you really need to work on. Like he's got that whip and it shows consistently where there's not very much wasted movement. Like we talked about it. The one thing when you talk about like the mechanics and things like that, it's or like how he is in the pocket. It's just like a little bit of bounciness a little bit. But in examples like this where quick game, the ball is coming out fast, very efficient. That does look pretty. All right. So is this next one going to be on the other end of the spectrum? Actually, no. I so I have two Ooh. clips for for all the prospects. Um, oh, yeah. For almost everyone, there's one good one and one bad one. I don't really have a bad one for Daniels. Like I said, I, okay. I really think almost everything he does is just really clean and efficient. Um, and you'll see it here a little bit further down the field. He's going to throw to to I think it's Brian Thomas, um, mm -hmm. just outside the numbers here. But again, you're going to see. Oh yeah. 
I think what's really important in this clip is you just see how well he keeps his base under him while he's like, I mean, just look how like he's just very light on his feet. There's no panic to any of this. It's very like he understands the rhythm of how this throw is supposed to go. I mean, that type of stuff you just see all over Daniels' film. Like he is he's never ever late because of his feet or his mechanics or anything like that. Sometimes he'll be late just in terms of like, you know, if he's coming to the backside, he's just doesn't anticipate and doesn't want to throw it before he sees it. Mm -hmm. But on stuff like this, where he knows the ball is going to come out, the rhythm and timing is, is uh, you can tell he's a five-year player. And that's what I do like about him is that you can tell like the reps have mattered for him. Like they, you can really, really tell that he's a guy who's played a lot of clean football um, within rhythm. And I think that's really good. Yeah. And one thing looking at him is the anticipation questions for me are like you said, when it's more over the field. And I feel like that's kind of, I know Nate Tyson's mentioned like when he played quarterback, he didn't throw over the middle because it required that anticipation. But on these kind of like smash concepts, you really start to see that, you know, he does have that in his game, but it's more when he's throwing outside the numbers because obviously he's getting set to throw before Brian Thomas is even looking at him. So I just want to see it one more time. It's and, so and, and to your point, it's a pre-snap indicator. Like, look at mm – -hmm. I mean, he kind of knows, okay, two high safeties. He comes yeah. off as soon as he sees this corner's not taking Thomas. He just instantly knows, okay, boom, too high. I can throw into this. Like he's not, it's not trying to anticipate coming back blind. Like you're, you're seeing it the whole time. And with that type of stuff, he's really, really good and really efficient. Would you say he's one of the top guys when it comes to that processing ability in this class? I think for pre-snap stuff. Yeah. Like I think he does. I think he does a really good job at that. And I think he's just, He's like I said, he's not necessarily maybe like a super aggressive or anticipatory passer. And that is where I have some reservations with him. But yeah, again, on stuff like this, where it's very clearly like I'm just cutting the field in half and I'm basically just checking what you do immediately off the snap based on like some of the pre-snap indicators. He's just really clean and efficient and almost never really puts the harm, the ball in harm's way in, in those instances. So you said pre-snap. So what happens post-snap or when he has to go through the whole field? I, I think like we've both said, he struggles, I think, in my opinion, to anticipate a little bit like he he can still go one to two to three. The footwork is clean and he keeps himself balanced and he keeps himself in position to throw. It's just I think he's more of a guy who, especially over the middle of the field, when guys are moving, when pieces are moving, um, when he's turning blind almost or like having to understand, like without seeing it, where zone defenders are he kind of just doesn't trust himself to jam throws in there. He's like I said, someone who wants to see it happen first in college. That's great. When you have two first round picks and you're protected all the time behind <laughs> probably two other first round pick tackles. I think in the NFL, it's going to be, he's going to have to speed things up a little bit and get a little bit faster. And the situation is why it's so bizarre and why it does scare me at the next level, because he doesn't have the excuse of like, you know, he's a young guy or, you know, he doesn't trust his receivers or he's running for his life. And that's why, you know, the backside dig is coming open. It's like literally in this game, I think the one where he gets blown up is the backside dig is coming open, but he tucks it as it's happening. So if you're a coach, how are you rationalizing that? Are you like, hey, we're just going to have to live with that? Because it seems like a pretty significant flaw for a guy who had the perfect situation, all this experience, and still doesn't seem to trust his ability to hit those windows before they maybe develop in front of him. No, I, I think you're spot on there. Like, that's basically my concern. Um, like, well, like you said, when you have younger guys who maybe the circumstances aren't great, you can like – excuse is the wrong word but like you can start to piece together why things might not be clean all the time and maybe they don't trust this or that blah 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 when you get into a situation like Jaden, where he's played for five years in a handful of different offenses he's behind an offensive line that is one of the better ones in the uh in the college football sphere you would like him to have a little bit more aggression you would like to have him have a little bit better understanding of, of where moving pieces are post snap and be able to, to trust his arm and trust his ability to get there. Cause I think his arm is good enough to make those throws. If he would just do them, he just yeah. a lot of times kind of refuses to do it unless it's, you know, like I said, he's kind of the only time he really likes to throw middle of the field is when he started to like that side. So like, mm -hmm. uh, like maybe he's reading a dagger concept and he's already open to the side that the dig is coming through. Okay. He'll throw that. Mm -hmm. But if he has to go backside to something, it's, it gets a little bit dicier there, I think. Yeah, and then when you mix in that part of his game and the fact that he's already older and the frame, and you mentioned he has – it's not like he has a bad arm, but it's more that one when you're playing in New England and you have like those really gusting wins sometimes, you got to slice the ball through the air. And 
I think the fact that when you look at him scrambling, he usually runs to run. He doesn't run to throw. And I think part of that is a survival instinct because he knows it's not comfortable for him to throw when he doesn't have a good base under him. So is he a talented guy? And do I think he could go to a Pro Bowl with that like deep touch and the running ability and the way he operates in the pocket? Absolutely. But if you're talking about a guy where you're trying to compete with the Josh Allens and the Patrick Mahomeses and you have that third overall pick with a runway where like – Realistically, I think even Robert Kraft understands that this team is probably not going to be a legitimate playoff contender for a couple of years. Let uh, let uh, Jaden Daniels go to someone like obviously maybe the commanders, but like the Vikings seem like a better fit where it's like they got the weapons. He can exploit them pretty quickly. That's a place where he can, I think, thrive. But I just don't love the fit in New England necessarily. But I do like the fit better for the people's champion, Drake May. We're going to dive into his film. But first, quick word from our friends at Prize Picks. Be right back. Get in on the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. You can win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000 with basketball and hockey entries today on prize picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Price Picks is the best way to get action on sports in more than 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. I personally love Price Picks because they're super easy to use, easy to navigate, and they offer injury insurance, so your entries stay live even if one of your players gets injured. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what make Price Picks the number one fantasy sports app. Download the app today and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, now let's get to my guy, Drake May, the one who I think after Caleb Williams, I know we've talked about this, we're on the same page, has the most upside. Now, there are some uh, mechanical difficulties that he's going to have to work through in the NFL. That's undeniable. I feel like relative to what he offers, it's not really that big of a deal, especially if he's got the mentality and he works at it with a coach like Alex Van Pelt, who can actually help him refine his footwork in season, unlike what you get with most offensive coaches where it's more about scheme and matchups and things like that. I feel like it'd be a really good situation for him. So let's dive in the film. First, look at what he does well. This is in one of his... Worst performances, and this is like a good example of how even in the bad games, he still has just some ridiculous moments. Yeah, I I, I do want to I want to touch on that the the bad game thing. People really harp on the Clemson game in the North the the NC State game, dude. I, I like I ran through the NC State game again to pull clips for this. He played so like he like he missed a couple of throws, and obviously they got the hell beat out of them in that game. But he made like 10 plays that are like, yeah, you take this first overall in yep. any class. I mean, obviously, you also take Caleb first overall in any class, but it's the same caliber of prospect is what I'm trying to say. Anyway, here's the good with Drake. Um, what you're going to get with Drake is he's just basically going to end up throwing a dig here, but you're going to see him move in the pocket. And I know people love to harp on his footwork and it's weird and it's a little bit like he plays with like a skinny base and all that stuff. I think more often than not, he actually does kind of get himself back to where he needs to be in a lot of cases. And you're going to see that here where um, he's going to kind of get moved. He's going to do his drop back and then he's going to get to here. And it's just, I don't know. Like it looks so funny when he goes back and bounces. This is a weird spot to be. Ideally you would rather have your back foot a little bit more back behind you. You'd rather have your front foot a little bit more in front of you. You know, like, like, you're making a T with the line of scrimmage almost right. like, it, you know what I mean? Um, you would ideally like that. Cause I think that just gives you a lot more flexibility, mobility when you're trying to get through your reads and trying to throw to be ready to throw any area of the field. Um, but then by the time he comes back and gets to the throw, he wants to make, he gets lined up and he's perfectly square to where he wants to throw very clean throwing motion throws right into it. I, I mean, just like, this is the type of stuff that I think you see more often than not with mm -hmm. Drake, where again, the footwork, it does look weird until he gets to the end product. I'm not really going to dispute that. Yeah. Like, I mean, like, see, what does he do here? Like this, where is it? It's like the little, where he puts his, like, like his front foot is just kind of doing whatever the hell it wants there. He's not really in control of anything that's going on here, but again, he gets back to exactly where he needs to be when he needs to make the throw. And that's all that matters. If you get to the end point at the right time and you make the right throw, I don't really care how it looks like Lamar Jackson has really weird footwork, honestly, but he's always on time and he always makes the right throw. So like, who cares 
if it looks weird. And I think I think Drake's footwork is actually very reminiscent of Lamar because Lamar also plays with like a skinny base and he plays with like kind of unique timing and and like some of the footwork like he's not the Jaden one two three balls out like that style of of rhythm he kind of plays to the the beat of his own drum but Lamar does that and I think Lamar is one of the best passers in the NFL and he's never really late I think more often than not you see Drake pull this off as opposed to you know some of the wonky clips um, people like to pull even even the next one I have for him but still and how much of the footwork stuff has to do with the air raid offense itself? Because it's not like the West Coast where the footwork is integral to the offense, where each step is telling you where you need to go in your progression. Because the air raid is really more like your like like throw to space and all that, and it's just not quite as structured. Could you, so, could you explain how the offense that he was in may have affected his development? I think there is some of that. I, I think there's a. I mean, and two. So the 2022 offense and the 2023 offense were both different. I mean, they're both kind of in the air raid college. We're going to play two by two spread BS all the time, but he was playing in two different offenses. So you even beyond the spread thing, you know, the throw to space kind of played to the rhythm of your own drum, all that sort of stuff. He still had to work in two different offenses. So you almost like lose whatever timing you got from the first offense to begin with. So I think that that hurts him a lot. The other thing is, especially in 2023, this offensive line was bad. And I think it seems as though they gave him a little bit of freedom to be like, listen, man, we know it's bad. You're going to get pressured. Just get to the throw. However you need to get to the throw, get to the throw. And I actually kind of admire his ability to do that in a lot of situations. And I think that's where the, you know, Oh, he drifts in the pocket all the time thing mm-hmm. comes from. It's yeah. because he's drifting away from pressure 90% of the time. Like there are a couple of times where he's wrong and it looks bad and he, he runs himself into trouble. Yes. But they gave him a lot of freedom to deal with that stuff. And I think he generally did a pretty good job. It's just that again, like I said, the bad ends up looking really bad because they, they kind of gave him this license to go do it behind a really bad offensive line. Yeah, the drifting critique is one that bothered me once I really started to look into it. Because like you said, sometimes it just does look weird when he is going towards someone. And if it ends up becoming a pressure situation, it's like, oh, why'd you do that? But especially when you consider how often he's getting hit or is pressured in a game, he will consistently move to the open part of the pocket. And people never talk about that. It's only acknowledged that he does the drifting. But it's like, yeah, but look how often he's getting himself to a better base when there's a free rusher coming or how often somebody's coming unblocked and he's able to make them miss. Like it's, and that's one of the things that I really like about him and feel like is a reason why it's not just ceiling and it's not just tools. Like, I think it's foolish for you just to say like, Oh, this guy's ceiling is through the roof. And it's like, yeah, well, can he play quarterback? This guy plays quarterback on a consistent basis, despite the fact that the system around him isn't really putting him in position to succeed. So this is why I have you on, man. I because sometimes I feel like I'm just like talking to myself, but I'm going crazy. But it's I think it's really impressive the way he's able to navigate pressure on a consistent basis, even though sometimes you'd like to see him maybe be more consistent. Yeah, uh, and I think the last thing I want to say to that point is like I've kind of said stuff like this all throughout the draft process, but like when you watch um Jaden, when you watch JJ, when you watch Michael Penix, even Bo Nix, these are guys who played in really good offenses, generally behind really good offensive lines. It you're going to get cleaner examples of them playing football more often than not with Drake. And to the same extent, Caleb, they're playing behind really bad offensive lines with the weight of the world on their shoulders. There's going to be bad plays, man. Like that's just how it goes when you're playing this way, this aggressive when like the world is on your shoulders behind a bad offensive, like that's just how it's going to go. I think people kind of cling too much to you know the one bad play for every seven good ones it's like i don't know man the seven good ones are pretty insane to me especially when people and this is the last thing i'll say because we do need to move on but also when Mm -hmm. people talk about like oh he's gonna have to sit for a year i'm like if if you feel uncomfortable with the supporting cast and you just don't want him to develop like worse habits i totally understand that perspective but to act like he can't survive a bad offensive line or poor talent When it's literally his entire 2023 season and you see him compensate for bad offense all the time, it blows my mind. It's like, no, he's the guy that you want when your offense is bad and there's not a lot of help around him because he is the guy that like raises all tides and makes everyone better. So, all right, now let's get into the negatives because I think we're, we made it very clear. Like some of the discussion around him is a little wonky. He's a very good player. All right. Now this is the, 
<laughs> yeah, so th this is a clip that I know I've seen I've seen from some other people as well. Um, it's going to start off with him drifting. And again, I I just don't really care about it that much. He ends up like sort of drifting himself into pressure here. I think what he sees is the end is crashing, so he wants to get away from it. Um, and he's just going to assume his right tackle is going to be able to come off this a little bit sooner and give him a little more space. That's obviously not what happens. The crime to me is not that May is like kind of floating into the direction that he wants to throw and away from this rusher crashing in. I don't think that's the crime. I think the crime is that when he kind of settles here at the end and goes back to make the throw, his hips just never get back in line with the receiving court with the, the receiver that he's throwing to. Like this guy is obviously well outside the numbers. He's going to try to settle basically at the sideline. May's hips are kind of aimed like at almost in between. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At the defender, like in between the hash and the numbers here, like that's just, it's hard to get the full snap and rotation and really like let the ball sling out that way when you're trying to throw this way. Otherwise it just kind of ends up in arm throw. And that's why I think you see this one sail on him. It doesn't, at all end up where it's supposed to be. He's not able to throw it on as much of a line as he wants to. It's just not good placement. Like that to me is more the crime in this clip. And I think that can happen when he plays. So like, I mean, you'll see it even at, at the, at the top of his drop here, almost like the last clip where sometimes because he gets so just weird and out of sorts with his footwork until he wants to throw. There are these instances, like I said, where he, can't actually get where he needs to be before he does throw. I again, I think 85% of the time he does, but you're going to have these instances where because he plays with such a tight wonky base, you're just going to end up with these plays where he can't get all the way there. Yeah, and this is why I like having you on because when I looked at this because I wasn't sure where he was really supposed to throw because obviously the receiver slipped, so I was like, all right, is that where he wanted it but the receiver didn't get there because he fell down or what happened? So that is interesting. I didn't even think about that that the hips literally in the completely yeah, like wrong he's, spot. Yeah, let me see if I can uh, pull it back right before he he actually goes to throw here. Like this. Yeah, that's not great. This this looks like he's throwing a go ball down, like deep down the sideline. Like, like if he was throwing a nine ball here, perfect. But he's not. He's throwing a comeback to the to the sticks. Like it's just it's just really hard to get snap and rotation when you're throwing that way. And when it comes to generally, one thing I wanted to ask about is when he misses, like I, you know, I DM'd you about how like a lot of his misses are when he's either pressured or rolling to his right. And they tend to be like, I know there's some talk about like how he puts the ball in harm's way. I think that's a total fallacy. I feel like his turnover worthy plays are usually because he's missing either high or behind his receiver. From what you've seen, what's the reason for that? Is it really just that he like, obviously when he's scrambling, maybe he's just not set or what is it exactly? Because those are the times when I feel like if there is any legitimate bust potential with his game, it's in the fact that if you're going to miss high and behind, that's when you're giving defenders opportunities to pick you off. And that's when you're going to get yourself in trouble. I think what you see a lot of times with these guys who have tight bases is they're going to end up missing high or low a lot. And like, it, it just, because like, you're just not as centered. You're not as balanced as um, like Jaden Daniels, like Jaden Daniels doesn't really miss high or low like that. Um, on the other hand, you see Drake may miss high or low like that a lot. And honestly, to bring Lamar back again, another narrow thrower, he's a guy who misses high a lot mm -hmm. because he just, there's something about the balance that you're able to hold when you have a little bit of a wider, firmer base with these guys who play so narrow, so tight, you kind of just end up getting these sprays where you end up a little bit toesy and the ball ends up like kind of just, just sailing on you a little bit there. Okay, that's something I'll start looking out for because I really just wasn't sure. And then to your point, he misses low. I feel like that's usually what you see in like the quick outs where mm -hmm. that's where like I know JT O'Sullivan cannot stand the fact that it's basically <laughs> a handoff and he's constantly just throwing it into the dirt where I'm like, yeah, I'd be pissed <laughs> off. But if that's what he does like two times a game, I'll be honest, unless it's on like a fourth and two or a critical third down, I do not care because he can come back the next drive and then complete a completely magical play where you're like, all right, yeah, this is – this is why we draft this guy third overall. All right, moving on from Drake May because he could be his entire own show. Let's talk about J.J. McCarthy, the guy who maybe could get taken over, over Drake. I hope it doesn't happen, but still, I do want to emphasize, I do think he's a really talented player who has a promising future. So let's get a little bit into his tape and see what the strengths are, what the weaknesses are, and maybe how we can improve going into uh, the league. I feel like I have an idea, but I'm curious <laughs> what you think. All right. Yeah, so uh, this, uh, I think, was from the 2022 
uh, playoff or whatever. Th- this to me, so McCarthy, I think McCarthy is very much a quarterback when he is just one to two to three. Like he knows exactly where he's throwing. He can just set himself up down the hallway and he rips it. I think he gets really, really good and clean rotation. Like he's a, people have done this thing ever since the the quarterback show on Netflix, where it's like, you know, all the, the back rotation type of stuff because of Patrick Mahomes. I think there actually is kind of something to that. Um, and Caleb, Caleb very obviously has this. Um, but I think McCarthy has this as well, where he just has a very like loose, snappy over body uh upper body when he needs it and so i think when he's throwing um just kind of on time like this you see like how like he just it there's just like a pop to it yeah and he has a very consistent like almost like he's throwing a dart at the very end of his his throwing motion it's very kind of like i said with Jaden. it's very forceful it's very like you can tell that this is something that he's like almost drilled on. Whereas there are some other quarterbacks that there's just a little bit more looseness to it where it doesn't feel like they have that. I I think McCarthy, when he's throwing like this, there's just so much pop to his upper body. And I think that that's really what makes his arm go. One more time. And if I might add, he stays very balanced here and very like mm-hmm. firm base, like very, he's also very, very good at that when he's throwing within rhythm. Like he's just, this is where I think all the like Kevin O'Connell play action stuff comes in when you're just going one, two, three, ripping a deep over like this. I mean, he's got all the talent in the world to make that throw 10 times out of 10. And I'm, I'm not sure if we're, are we, are you going to talk about the throwing to the left thing or can I bring that yep. up real quick? Yep. All right. Perfect. <laughs> we'll bring that up next. All right. Same page. I like that. All right. Also let's show some love to my boy, Paul. Thank you, buddy. Thanks for watching. Appreciate you. All right. Now let's see what's up because for context, if you don't know, uh, Nate Tice did a really great breakdown on JJ McCarthy a couple weeks ago. And one thing he pointed out was the fact that McCarthy has Pretty terrible numbers when he's throwing to his left for some reason. And then even if you look at the tape, he can do it. It's not like he's physically incapable of throwing to his left, but there definitely are some really wonky moments that you don't see when he's throwing to other parts of the field. So here we go. Yeah. So even before I roll this, so with May in the in the in his bad clip, I said his hips and basically his foot alignment were just like not at all where the target was supposed to be. McCarthy does this a lot when he's throwing to his left, where he will just his front foot will just way over stride and like he'll open up basically all of his hips and shoulders. And so he kind of just ends up like fully having to use his arm instead of like having a base where he can trigger everything up. Um, Mitch Trubisky actually did this a lot. And this is why the whole, you know, Mitch Trubisky can't throw left. Like this is why is because Mitch would always just swing his left foot wide open. And he's never able to like really drive on the ball with his entire body on this clip. You're going to see JJ trying to throw a speed out here. You can see even like <laughs> on, upon his setup, where is he throwing to? Like he's, it looks like he's trying to throw at the, like the 30, that the edge, like he is so far opened up to the left side. It almost looks like he could be throwing a screen, like a smoke screen out to that side, but he's trying to throw, you know, six yard speed out here. Um, and it just, like I said, when you do that, you kind of end up like you're all arm. Like you, you just don't have the rest of your body to, sequence everything and that's why you you end up out of whack here and he ends up a little bit high a little bit behind it's just really hard to get that same pop and forcefulness that he had in the last clip when he when you don't have a firm base under you throwing you know aimed to where you need it to be and we talked about with drake may where like his base was too narrow with jj I think he has some of the most repeatable mechanics in this class. Like, it just looks like you said, it looks like it's rehearsed and it's something that he goes through consistently. But I also noticed it feels like his feet are almost too wide, where he's just kind of like, it's not really shoulders length. It's a lot wider than that. And sometimes I feel like that kind of translates to his accuracy. Can you give your thoughts on that? And because I don't really understand how personally, it's just something where like you see, you see different quarterbacks and know what's kind of traditional. And for him, it just looks a little wonky. He definitely is one of the more like wider based guys, especially in this class. A lot of the other guys play a little bit tighter. Caleb kind of also plays with a wide base, but I think his arm is so adjustable that it literally doesn't matter (laughs) at all. Like his feet don't matter. Um, So I'm glad we don't even have to talk about him because like talking about his (laughs) mechanics are just not even a a worthwhile discussion. Um, But no, McCarthy does have like a, a kind of a wide base. And I think you see that kind of in this clip. And I think it's why he's, or it's not why he's an overstrider. Like he's an, he's an overstrider and that leads to him having a wide base. But I think that that's his biggest issue is that he just like, 
I don't know what it is like. I don't know how you get this way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know why some guys play with tighter bases. Why got, why some guys play with um, wider bases. Maybe JJ McCarthy was a pitcher in a past life. I don't know. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but I, I do think it's a big issue. And I think when he gets into the NFL, he'd probably like to see it a little bit tighter, but there have still been really good quarterbacks who have played with some wider bases. Like Tom Brady kind of played with a wider base for a majority of his career. So it's not like a death knell, mm-hmm. but I think, coupled with some of his overstriding issues to the left, you'd like to see it get cleaned up a little bit for sure. So at the next level, obviously like mechanics are one of those things where it's such a fine line of what you want to fix because the priority is for somebody to feel comfortable. Like you don't want someone doing something that feels unnatural because that's when you start getting into trouble and then things start to break down. What would you want him to fix? Obviously, like we said, with the just kind of swinging his foot open on these throws left, but generally, what would you say would be an area of emphasis for him to become more consistent in this area of his game? Yeah, I think just try to get maybe a smidgen more narrow and then just really drill into him that when he's opening up like this to his left, and it's really mostly when he's in rhythm. Like there are some instances where, um, you know, maybe he's got to like dance around in the pocket for a second and he's like kind of jumping and throwing or something to his left. Usually perfectly fine there. You really see a lot of the misses when he has to like, or when he's playing in rhythm and he just overstrides, opens himself up too much. And it's like, ah, okay, well, that's bad. I think that needs to get fixed. But also like that type of thing is, pretty fixable like to me footwork is very fixable Mm -hmm. throwing motion is not like you throw how you throw for the most part there are some tweaks that you can make and some guys have changed a little bit of stuff here and there but like for the most part your upper body is what it is it's the feet that you need to fix but it's the feet that you can fix like that stuff i think to me is a lot more fixable so i in terms of the footwork stuff with mccarthy it does need to get cleaned up maybe it never does maybe he is mitch trubisky but i think it's at least something where you can like see the optimism and see why okay two years of good coaching it's not gonna be a problem that was a perfect transition talking about upper body (laughs) we're moving on to michael (laughs) Penix jr all right so we're gonna get into some of this film because we already kind of touched on it where Again, he had significant injuries to his throwing shoulder. So there's gonna that's gonna have some impact on the way you play. Now we're gonna throw some clips up. I believe this is it, and see how exactly his mechanics are helping and hurting his game. Yeah, so I, there's not like a whole lot of great stuff to say about uh Penix's mechanics, at least in my opinion. Like I said, I think um he throws with a really, really low release point which i think is almost always a problem it's i think part of why he struggles to like get the ball up and over to add touch it's why he's like very much a one speed thrower um i also think that a lot of the times when he throws he like drops a lot of his weight and so like he'll end up even shorter than he should be which again i think hurts you trying to get the ball up and over um, which is why he struggles to throw with bodies in his face at the same time i think when Penix is like one to two to three things are clean he's not rushed he feels like he's within the rhythm of the play he does have like a, a decent throwing motion. And again, on throws where he doesn't have to add touch where he can just kind of line drive, throw it. I think he does have a clean and powerful motion. I think you see this here. It's just kind of one, two, three comes back, hitch, boom, balls right where it needs to be. When he can throw on a line like that, it looks really nice. Like one, two, three hitch. Everything is in perfect rhythm. Just chucks it like those type of throws. He looks like a really, really clean passer. It's some of the other stuff like we'll talk about in a minute that gets me more pause and then so i hate to backtrack but you mentioned touch i should have mentioned this with jj but that's one critique of his game is that it's really not a lot of touch it's mostly the same like kind of line drive throws so without getting too much maybe into what we're going to get into with this next point what's the difference between someone like jj and Penix in terms of how you project their ability to improve that part of their game at the next level jj i still have some concern about that him ever improving that because i think there are a handful of reasons guys cannot have touch for jj i think it's because he's such a long-limbed player like some of those guys just kind of struggle get to get touch outside the numbers like jared goff has this issue like outside the numbers throws like outbreakers are not his best balls um trevor lawrence for as good as i think he is those are not his best throws um, and then JJ McCarthy, again, he's a very long limbed, like long levered thrower. I think sometimes those guys have issues getting touch, um, with the ball. Luckily, like I said, I think if you clean up some of JJ's base, that could go away a little bit and you could ease some of that concern, but it is something I'm like mildly worried about with Penix. The op- it's, it, it's the opposite issue almost where he's like, so like t-rex armed in the way that he throws that it's just really, really hard to, again, get that like up and over 
and and put like arc and put layering under the ball it's just really hard for him to do it with the way that he throws he's almost like he's dude, he's almost like shot putting the ball and like you're just never gonna get i think good touch when you're when you're throwing like that it's really really hard all right so let's move on to this next clip see what we got yeah so this even before i started the difference to me between these two clips the last clip everything is in rhythm one two three hitch backside boom balls out this clip he's trying to like he kind of pumps at the top of his drop back and so everything ends up like really violent and rushed at the end he is just not a quarterback who can like adjust the way that he's playing or throwing you know what i mean like he's a very robotic everything needs to be crisp and clean it needs to be in rhythm or he just like cannot function i think you're going to see that here he's still perfectly clean in the pocket but one two you can see him like I think he's trying to like pump and get this corner to sit and stay, which is a perfectly fine thing to do. You're going to see this a lot when any, any time guys are trying to throw the corner into this like cover two honey hole. That's perfectly fine. Problem is when he does that, he just ends up look how much more like violent he's trying yeah. to throw as opposed to how it looked when he was one, two, three, everything's in rhythm. He knows where it needs to be. I think when he has to like adjust and speed himself up like this, he just, it's not a very adjustable, flexible thrower. And I think you see that um, in a lot of instances like this. And was this something that he struggled with before his injuries? Like, was this a thing at Indiana as well? Or was it more, again, kind of the effect of the injuries that he's been through in his career? I, I think it's the effect of the injuries. I mean, like when you, I think he shredded both shoulders and then his knee twice. I, I mean, that's oh. just going to change the way that you throw fundamentally. And I think, I think Penix, very early on in his career was a little bit smoother still i think maybe he still kind of threw the way he threw in the sense of like kind of short armed his release kind of had um you know dropped his weight a little bit but i think it's like gotten worse and more pronounced and less flexible the, the more he's played basically just because of the injury stuff has added on to him and then when you think about his game like the big critiques are obviously how he plays under pressure um kind of how he is once he gets past that first three and i feel like the texas game was the perfect showcase for what he does well because he even said it after the game. It's like we knew what they were going to do. Like they would show two high safeties and those two high safeties, not only would they not move, sometimes they wouldn't even do the right thing. Like that touchdown he threw the post where this quarter safety is supposed to poach and he just doesn't do anything and it's wide open. So that's kind of one of the bigger things for me why I understand why he would go first just because, again, there's not a lot of quarterbacks and he, he's got the ice in his veins, the leadership and all those things. But in the NFL, you got to deal with pressure. You're going to have to deal with post-snap shifts where even if you get comfortable with that, there are going to be certain defenders like a Todd Bowles or somebody who throws some crazy shit at you that you can't really prepare for. And it's got to just be like, all right, you have to understand where you got to go and process these things quickly and adjust on the fly. And that's where, like you said, when he has to kind of make these quick adjustments, it speeds up his process. And then things start to fall apart and you get these really bad misses where people talk about Drake May all the time with the uncatchable passes. I looked it up on PFF. Michael Penix Jr. had more uncatchable, inaccurate passes than Drake May did. So if you want to have this conversation where, like, some people are making it seem like Penix is just, why isn't he a top 10 pick? Why are people talking about him? He's top three. It's like, let's have an honest discussion. We can like the things that Penix does well. But when you talk about things that can be corrected, like with Drake May, like we said, there could be more consistency. And like with the base, there may always be some issues, but it's not this kind of thing where there are legitimate physical limitations where it might never actually get fixed, especially for a prospect who is much more floor than he is ceiling. That is basically like my line on on Penix basically is that it's just hard to I think fix the problems that he has like there is stuff I really do admire about Michael Penix I think he's really tough he obviously has like the ice in the vein stuff that you were talking about um really good thrower down uh deep down the field um like I admire the aggression that he's willing to play with all that sort of stuff but like yeah like we both said it's really really hard to I think fix some of the issues that he has with his upper body. And I think his throwing motion is never going to get more flexible. And that's a really tough pill to swallow. When you look at guys like Caleb, who obviously is like, you know, top one percentile in terms of that. But like Drake may has a very fluid upper body. JJ McCarthy has not to the same degree as those guys, but like, there's more of it. I think with him, Bo Nix, I think has a very loose upper body. Like when you compare him to basically all of these other players, 
Penix just doesn't have those adjustable arm slots. And I think when you look at basically all of the top 10 NFL quarterbacks, they've all got that to some degree. Not all of them are as insane as Patrick Mahomes or anything um, or Lamar Jackson, but like they all have enough flexibility in the way that they're able to throw and create certain arm angles. It's just really hard to see that with Penix. And I think when he gets pressured more in the NFL, which compared to the Washington offensive line where he never got pressured, um, it's going to be something he has to interface with a lot. And I think it's going to dramatically change the way that he plays and the way that he's able to produce. I think we're all rooting for Michael Penix Jr. So fingers crossed he goes somewhere with a phenomenal offensive line and some really good talent outside the numbers. Derek, as always, it's been a blast, brother. Thank you so much for coming on. Please let the people know where they can find you and what excellent stuff you got coming down the pipeline. Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, thank you for having me. This is always an absolute blast. I love doing this show. Um, you guys can find me on Twitter at QB class. It's up there on the screen um, over at Bleacher Report. I do all of our skill players for, for the draft stuff. I think our final big board, I want to say a couple of days before the draft. So look out for that. We actually just dropped our most recent one a few days ago. So you can go look at that as well. And then over at reception perception, dropping all of my uh, quarterback shrugging profiles. Most recent one was Michael Penix. We'll have Spencer Rattler up uh, pretty soon. And then I think Michael Pratt before the draft. And then that might be it. But, uh, you know, we, we got all the main ones covered. So. If you read my stuff on CLNS, then you're already familiar with Derek's work. I like to lean on people smarter than me when I give my little like breakdowns on background and my little blurb scouting reports. If it's a quarterback, it is almost always your blurb. So again, bud, you're one of my favorites. Thank you so much for coming on. And thank you all, as always, for watching the show. And now take care of yourselves. Take care.